right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golan from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Dan Gingis, who is up in Chicago. How are you doing, Dan? I'm great, John. Thanks for having me on. How are you doing? Great. I'm here in, uh, in, San, in a beautiful sunny San Diego, as usual. And Dan's a keynote speaker and experienced coach, more than 20 years of professional experience at companies like McDonald's, Discover, Humana, all household names. And what we're going to talk today about is how remarkable customer experience can help you sell more. So Dan, before we start, we've heard a lot about customer experience. It's become a bit of a buzzword over the last number of years. But what do, what do you mean by customer experience? Because I don't think everybody sees it in the same way. Sure. So what I mean is the customer experience is how a customer feels about every single interaction they have with your company. And if you break that down, there's two really critical parts. The first is how they feel. So we know that you know, pick your uh, euphemism, feeling is believing, uh, um, perception is reality, whatever it is, mm -hmm. the way that the, con the customer feels about doing business with you is their reality. So for example, if you just built what your uh, IT department says is the world's greatest mobile app that's super cool and got all the best functionality and whatever, and your customers say it's difficult to use, then the answer mm -hmm. is it's difficult to use, simple. Uh, the second part about it is that it's every single interaction, and that's where companies really tend to fall down, is that it it is everything from the sales and marketing to every channel that you can engage with, to your social media presence, to the direct mail that you send, to the billboard out on the highway, to whatever connection that somebody has with your company. It all gets added up into their perception of the experience. Yeah, and I and I think that's the really important thing for people to understand. It's it's the it's all of the experiences because I always liken it to um, a while back. I had an experience when we were still flying. You know, you, you get to the airport, check in is really easy. Got through those security lines really fast. Plane left on time. Flight was great. Came in a few minutes early. Everybody's feeling good, and then the luggage took an hour and a half to come off. But and that's a problem in itself, but they never made any announcements. They just left everybody sitting there. And so what was your, all of those great experiences are washed away in one bad experience, which if we'd been informed, yeah, it would have been bad, but at least we would have known about it. But I think that's the point is that people don't realize it's the totality of experiences. right? Absolutely. And then when you add to that, that people tend to share either very negative yeah. or very positive experiences, you know, we don't share the average experience. Nobody's mm -hmm. ever said, hey, let me tell you about this perfectly so-so <laughs> restaurant I went to yesterday, right? So we share positive and we share negative. And the problem is, is you, the thing you remember from that story is that it Absolutely. took an hour and a half for the luggage and here you are telling people about it, yeah. right? Yeah. That's what happens. That's what salespeople sometimes miss is that that's what happens to existing customers at your company that are having a bad experience. And that's hampering your ability to sell because what they're hearing from other people is the bad experience that they had. And the reverse is true too, which is, and, and this is what I think that, you know, one of the biggest learnings for salespeople and for sales executives is that if we'd all just take one second and stop focusing on increasing our sales goals every year, and start mm -hmm. focusing on what I like to call the leaky bucket, which is all of the customers that are walking out the door to our yeah. competitors. If we can fix that leaky bucket, we won't have to put as much pressure on our salespeople because we're going to keep more of the customers that we have. And one of the B2Bs that I worked at for a while, it was literally it got to the point where for every million dollars in sales net, we had to go out and sell $1.4 million because mm -hmm. there was 400,000 going out the back door. That eventually is going to just kill all your sales staff. Yeah. And, and, and part of that obviously, isn't it, uh, is that the, the customer experience gets very weighted. Maybe it's at the beginning. It's a super experience when they're being sold to. It's a great experience when it's been implemented or whatever. But over time, the experience diminishes. Yeah, because we don't, spend nearly as much time focusing on our existing customers. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the perplexing part about it because especially now in a moment where business has halted really to a stop at almost in almost every turn, 
we all should be realizing that without customers, we don't have a business, right? right? So yes, it's always nice to acquire new customers, but the ones we have are the ones that are paying the bills right now, are the ones that are paying our paychecks right now. And we have to treat them just as importantly as we treat that brand new customer. And I think one of the things you sort of alluded to that often gets, that, that often happens is we have a, you know, people buy from people that they like. So we put yeah. that the salespeople by definition tend to have pretty good personalities and they tend to be reasonably likable people or they wouldn't be good at mm -hmm. what they do. But the problem is, is that we put a salesperson onto, onto a prospect, they sell the account, the customer is buying from John because they really like John. And then the first thing that happens after they sign yeah. the contract is John says, let me introduce you to Dan. He's going to take care of you from here on out. And it's like, but hold on a second. I bought from John. I don't want to work with Dan. I don't even know Dan. And I think that's a big problem. And it's one of the things that, you know, if as a sales team, we can figure out even for the first 30, 60 days that a client is with us, that we stay with them to make yeah. sure that that transition works and is smooth and they feel good about it. Because just like any consumer, you know, you've heard of buyer's remorse, right? When we buy an expensive sure. item, the first thing we think is, oh no, should I have done that? Mm -hmm. What do you think happens when somebody writes you a $50,000 check for your SaaS platform, right? The first Absolutely. thing they're thinking to themselves is, please don't let this get me fired, right? So yeah. they're, they've got buyer's remorse too. And what we have to do as salespeople is ensure that that buyer's remorse is turned off, that we, that we confirm for them that they made a really good decision. Yeah, and, and I think that's a really important point because, you know, the buyer's remorse. And it's also, I mean, say, let's stick with technology for a moment. If you make the buying decision for a piece of technology, even if lots of other people were involved, it always gets associated with somebody. And therefore, once you go into implementation and maybe there's a few problems, everybody goes, ooh, Dan, you, you bought this thing, it's not working. And then you go, oh, it's not working. And if, if, the, if the company that sold it to you, if you don't get the support during that period, you can feel very alone. And I think that's the mistake a lot of companies make is they leave the buyer feeling alone in the aftermath. For sure. You know, a, uh, a great um, example that I think comes up a lot is whenever there's a new sale at an organization, a sales organization, what happens? They all celebrate right? They ring a mm -hmm. bell or they honk a horn or whatever. They celebrate virtually on, you know, on, a, yeah. on a chat session. But what they're not doing is celebrating with the new customer, right? Mm -hmm. The new customer yeah. is left to sit there alone, wondering whether they just made a good decision while all the salespeople are going, yeah, we back another one, <laughs> right? And what they should be doing instead is celebrating with the customer, again, to confirm for the customer, hey, you just made a great decision. You know, your, your business is going to change. You're going to make more money. You know, we're so excited to work with you. That's like the, it's, it's such an important moment to, to get them in and, and really, you know, not now, it's not about getting them to buy what you're selling because they've already bought what you sold. Yeah. It's now to really get them feeling like they made a great decision and, and that the reverse of what you were just saying becomes true, that they become the hero at their company because they're associated with your product that, you know, that they brought in. Yeah, and I think people forget that sometimes, that especially B2B buying decisions, they can be career enhancing, they can be career limiting, depending on how successful they are, and it's your job to support them. And I also like the, the, the piece that you mentioned earlier about that handoff, because I think that is the problem. The handoff is so abrupt often, and it's not elegant, and you need to be more elegant. I had a great experience not too long ago where I purchased something um, for the company, and I had worked through it with the salesperson and they did stay involved. And when they brought in the, the account manager, eventually they actually came on screen and they happened to be together in the same building, but they were both in our, it was great. They were both in armchairs together in this place on screen. And they did this joint conversation with me and it was, it was all very elegant. The whole way it was done was super elegant and the handover was very smooth and it seemed natural. Yeah, and, and, and it wasn't probably very hard for them to do that or mm -hmm. even very expensive for them to do that, right? But it made you feel good. Um, another example that I love to share when I'm uh, keynoting is a company called Punk Post. And they're at punkpost.co. I don't know why it's not a .com, it's a .co. Mm -hmm. But they, um, they have an app and a website 
where you can go in and you can select a card to send to somebody. It could be a thank you card, a congratulations, happy birthday, whatever. And then you tell them what you want it to say and they hire an artist to hand draw the card. I'm going to give you an example because they actually sent me one after I mentioned them in uh, on one of my podcasts. And you can see how cool this thing is, right? Like this is, it's, it's mm -hmm. hand drawn and, and, uh, it, and then the envelope, it's the same thing. Like the envelope comes, you're like, what is this? And what they found, um, it, which is exactly what I've done here at my desk, is that when people get these cards, they put them up at their desk because right. they're cool to look at, right? And what happens then, people walk by and they see them and they say, oh, what's that? Oh, that's the card that I got from John, you know? And, and oh, wow, that's really neat. And you compare that to the other salesperson that just sends an email that says, you know, thanks so much. And it might be a great email, but nobody prints out an email and hangs it up on their cubicle, right? But a punk postcard, they will. And what I love about it is the cost of a punk postcard is roughly $7, which is mm -hmm. basically going out and buying a Hallmark card and putting a stamp on it and mailing it. Yeah. You're right about at $7, right? And yet, this is something that completely sticks out, that is completely memorable, that can really help in that transition after a sale, or maybe it's a big, maybe you got your, um, it's, it's right after you finally um, got the implementation done and mm -hmm. everybody's celebrating, yeah. send them a card. It's just, it's a simple, inexpensive way to show some appreciation and to stand out, I think, to, um, mm -hmm. to a customer. Yeah, and, and I, I think again, for them and they don't they don't pay yeah. me anything for that. What sounded like an advertisement, I swear. <laughs> no, not at all. And uh, well, you'll hopefully you'll get another card now in the mail, not too long <laughs> from them as well. <laughs> Thank you for the shout out. But what I like about that again is it's just those simple things to make a a customer feel that they're not alone. Because I really do believe that is that that is where the angst comes from. It's just feeling like you're alone or, and so those touch points are really, really important to say, okay, this, this company cares about. Well, and John, there is no better time to make your customers feel that way than right now when mm -hmm. we're all alone, when we're all literally being forced to stay at home by ourselves and not be with other human companions other than maybe a couple that might live with us. Us. Mm -hmm. And to me, that human connection, which is why people buy in the first place, and it's why people stay loyal to companies, that human connection is so important right now. And, you know, people are longing for it. I mean, they're longing for it in typical times, but now yeah. it's even more heightened. And I think those kind of things can make can go even farther with customers right now. Because, you know, what I believe is that customers today are looking for what I say, the two C's, calm and confidence. Right. Yeah. And because we're all nervous, we don't like uncertainty mm -hmm. and we're not necessarily depending on what industry we're in. We're not necessarily confident about what's going on next. I can tell you as a public speaker, it's not mm -hmm. the greatest profession to be in right sure. now. And so where do we look for calm and confidence? Well, we don't get it from the media. We don't get it from government. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. We might try to get it from our friends and family, but frankly, they're in the same position we are. <laughs> so they're not as calm and confident either. So what's left? Will you go to companies, you know, like Amazon that you that you uh, that you that you're loyal to, like Netflix that you're loyal to, like Facebook that you're loyal to, or Apple, and you and you want them to project that calm and confidence mm -hmm. so that you feel it too. And I believe that any company right now can play that role if you you know for your customers and. I wrote a piece recently about the um, about the emails that we all got in our inboxes about COVID nineteen and how yeah. many of them said exactly the same thing. Oh, right. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Oh well, we're cleaning our offices really, really well, and here's yeah. a link to the CDC website. Well, yeah. thanks a lot. But some we're companies, here for you. Decided, yeah, <laughs> but some companies decided to do something that was you know, more useful and more helpful and practical given who they were. And mm -hmm. it, to me, the ones that did that left me feeling better about them and feeling like, okay, these guys have my back. I trust them. You mentioned trust before. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm glad that I do business with them because even in a time of crisis, they're calm, they're confident, and they're taking care of me. Yeah, and I think that's a, such a such a great point because just to expand on it even to on that point is, your customers are probably going through a, an exercise right now of looking at where they can cut costs, regardless of whether they're going to or not. I guarantee you there's not a company out there that doesn't, even, that doesn't at least have contingency plans. You want to make sure you, you make the 
keep list and not the cut list, right? And if you don't reach out and, and yes, if you're it's not, like the, if you're, the nice list and the naughty list. Yeah, exactly. So to your right? point, if you're not if you're not reaching out and projecting confidence and they're not feeling like you're there to support them, you're gonna make the naughty list. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's absolutely true. So what do you think is, um, apart from that, what is one piece of advice you would give to everybody right now during this, this particular period, how they could really stand out from a customer experience point of view? You know, depending on the size of your business, I think one of the best things that you can do, uh, especially as salespeople are probably having trouble selling right now, is mm -hmm. reach out to your customers and just have a human conversation with them. Just tell them you were thinking about them, ask how their family's doing, ask how they're handling staying at home, um, and just show them that you care about them as humans. Don't try to sell them anything, don't ask for anything, and you'll be surprised at how far that goes uh, at a time where, again, we're all sort of longing for human connection, mm -hmm. and we are evaluating the companies that we're doing business with. Um, and, you know, the company that comes and tries to sell me real hard on an upgrade or something right now or an upsell or whatever, boy, that's a, I'm not going to feel great about them right now because I'm looking to cut costs, as you said, not add. Um, but somebody that just calls up and says, hey, Dan, I was thinking about you, you know, wondering how you're doing, how's it going in Chicago, you know, how's the family, you guys staying safe? Believe it or not, I mean, it sounds kind of quaint, but it, it means a lot to people right now. And I think that, you know, when they hang up the phone and they're like, man, I do business with, you know, 50 different vendors. They're the only one that's mm -hmm. called. People yeah. remember that kind of thing. No, I, th I think that's a I think that's a great point, because uh, the other thing to consider is there's a lot of people are at home for the first time. Uh, working from home or, or working from home on a consistent basis. And yeah, they're, they're feeling very disconnected from everything. So I think the more you can, you can reassure them with those simple connections is, is a great idea. And yeah, I agree with you. I don't know. I got so sick of getting all those emails about people telling me they were there for me. Um, and I was like, who is that? Who's here for me? Who's here for and me how, right now? <laughs> and how do you still have my email address? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think the actually reaching out properly is is a great idea. And again, uh, again, like I said, uh, you want to make sure that you know, from a selfish point of view, you want to make sure you're not on the cut list and and for out sure. of sight, out of mind. Yeah. For sure, and that's uh, and, and you know, you never know how or when you might be able to be of service to somebody. Exactly. And it might not be in the way that you think. It may not be in, in what your company does right now, but it might just be that, you know, you know something about something or you have something in common or, you know, you have a conversation that creates a connection that is something that's lasting and that creates a, a sense of loyalty that maybe wasn't there before that when we get out of this thing eventually, and you know, as my grandmother used to say, this too shall pass. We just don't know yeah. when, but it will. Uh, and when we get out of it, we want to make sure that our customers are still there and that they still, um, you know, that we're, that we're on the nice list, but that they're loyal to us long-term. And I think it's a, it is a, sometimes unfortunately a crisis brings people together. And, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a time where you have a chance, I think, to lock in lifetime loyalty by, be, by really being there for your customers, not just giving it lip service. If you're just going to copy everyone else's email, do us all a favor. Don't send any email, yeah, right? Please, please don't. I like you better if you don't. Exactly. <laughs> Listen, Dan, this is great. Uh, all of Dan's information will be in his contributor bio. But before we go, Dan, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Sure. Well, I am a uh, customer experience uh, speaker and coach. So I work with companies and audiences to teach them how a remarkable customer experience can be their best sales or marketing tool. And I have a huge library of real life examples. I always share real examples. So it's not just me telling you what to do. It's, it's showing examples of other companies that have been successful. I've developed a methodology uh, that, uh, that that when you sort of see the examples from these companies, you, you see how it all works. And the idea is, is when you're done talking to me, you should feel like you can go back to the office the next day and you have some simple, practical, inexpensive ways to improve the experience at your company and, and really create that loyalty that we're all craving right now. Yeah, and, and I would have to underline that I think customer experience is so critical. And as we said at the beginning of this, it, it is the totality of the experience. So you have to look at everything. So I would really encourage you to check out Dan's work. 
and really take a look at your own customer experience. And now is a great time. Now is a great time to do it. Uh, you know, you're probably never going to get a better time than now, actually, to have the bandwidth to check all parts of your customer experience. So again, listen, Dan, thank you very much. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeline of CRM. See you all for another ex expert interview really soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.